أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله we're in the blessed month of شعبان and on the doors of Ramadan and one of the great blessings of this faith that we adhere to is that we were given the sacred month of Ramadan to restore, to replenish, to renew our faith and to most importantly reconnect with the Book of Allah which is something that people should be doing throughout the year but many of us fail to do so and the Quran is in essence the nourishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided this ummah. So I wanted to look at a few text messages that relate to this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا كتب عليكم الصيام كما كتب على الذين من قبلكم لعلكم تتقون So in Al-Baqarah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, O oh, you who believe, Fasting has been prescribed for you, in other, in other words, made obligatory for you, just as it was uh, prescribed on the peoples before you, in order that you might learn taqwa, la'alakum tattaqun. The very first command in the Qur'an is to attaqo rabbukum, to have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And taqwa is one of the central and foundational meanings of our faith. It's it's a difficult word to translate, but it's related to protection, wiqaya, and the idea is that one wards off harm. In fact, the word in Arabic for believer, mu'min, means to to actually make oneself safe. So iman is amana, means to make safe, and billahi, through God, to make one, one safe through God, because if you're with God, then nothing can harm you, and anything that harms you is from God and by God and and because of the qadr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so, in essence, taqwa is warding off harm. It's entering into a, a silm. Udkhuru fi silmi kafa. It's entering into a, a, a surrender uh, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because Allah has given us a free will, but He wants us with that will to give up our will to align with His will. And, and this, this is the paradox of faith. And this is why the disbeliever is somebody who wants to assert his own will. And while we do have will and, and we do things in life, we choose things, Allah has given us all these choices, but He's also given us hudud. And so willfully entering into a surrender, a submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to enter into this deen. And that, in essence, is the way of warding off the... The, the consequences of being in a state of disobedience. So the, the month of fasting is, is a month in which Allah gives us ample opportunity to really align ourselves with this idea of being in a state of taqwa because taqwa is to guard yourself from all those things that are harmful to you. So you have five degrees according to our scholars, Ibn Juzay al-Kalbi mentions them in his tafsir, the five degrees of taqwa. The first one is just taqwa al-kufr, to, to really uh, be uh, guard oneself against kufr. And this is why every believer is a, a muttaqi who, who enters into Islam. Even if he's disobedient in his Islam, he still has taqwa of kufr. And so in that way, he's a muttaqi, and which is very important because hudal lil-muttaqin, the Quran is guidance for the people of taqwa. And so just being a believer means you're a muttaqi because you have taqwa of, of, of shirk. But then you, the, of kufr and shirk. But then you have taqwa of kabair, just being concerned about major, guarding oneself against major wrongs. And then you have taqwa sagair, guarding oneself against the lesser wrongs. And then taqwa of mubahat, being concerned about too much luxury in life, just having too much of the mubahat because it's all going to be a reckoning on the Day of Judgment. And even though it's permissible, if you're paying your zakat and doing all these things, 
Nonetheless, being extravagant is not something Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala la yuhib al-musrifin. He doesn't love the extravagant ones. And he calls the mubadhireen, the extravagant ones, ikhwan al-shayateen, the brothers of the demons. So Ramadan is this extraordinary opportunity for us to return to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why Allah reminds us again in Al-Baqarah, شَهْرُ رَمَضَانَ الَّذِي أُنزِلَ فِيهِ الْقُرْآنِ This is the month that the Qur'an itself was revealed, according to our tradition. هُدَى لِلنَّاسِ وَبَيِّنَاتٍ مِّنَ الْهُدَى وَالْفُرْقَانِ Guidance for humanity and clarifications of that guidance. وَالْفُرْقَانِ And a criterion. It gives you a criterion by which you judge. فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَصُمْهُ so whoever sees the moon, meaning whoever either sees it or has str strong evidence that it's been sighted, then let them fast it. And so the fasting is an obligation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what's really important in this month is to reconnect with the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, إِنَّ الْقُلُوبَ تَصْدَأُ كَمَا يَصْدَأُ الْحَدِيدُ إِذَا أَصَابُهُ الْمَاءُ the hearts oxidize just as iron oxidizes when it is subject to water. Qida ya Rasulullah wa majila'uha. How do we polish that rust? Qala kathratu dhikr al maut wa tirawat al Quran. By remembering uh, death and by reciting the Quran. So, Remembrance of death is one of the spiritual practices of a believer is to, in fact, really we should be remembering it in, in, in every prayer. So at least five times a day, one of the things that some of the Salaf said was uh, when, when they would enter into their prayer, you know, Sallu Salat al muwadda pray as if it's your last prayer. So going into the prayer with the idea that it's your, your last prayer, when you say goodbye to your family, not assuming that you're going to see them at the at the end of the day when you come home or you may not come home so just living life with this sense of the just that life itself is something precarious and that we could lose it at any time and so remembering much of death so remembering death doing this reflection on death and on the just the fact that life is temporal and that we're only here for a short time. In fact, the Quran, when it talks about the days of Ramadan, it uses what's known as jam'u qilla, which is the, the plural of pausity, ayyam al ma'dudat, you know, a few days. So this, this idea of Ramadan, the beginning of Ramadan is like the beginning of one's life and the end of Ramadan is, is, is a metaphor for the end of life. And then the Eid is the afterlife, when we, we feast on the efforts that we did here. So it's, it's just important to keep that in mind. The, the fact that this hadith which Imam al-Bayhaqi relates um, in the Shu'b al-Iman, and it's also it's in the Kanz al-Umal and in the Mishkat. But this hadith is, is an important hadith uh, in, in, in connecting the remembrance of death with the recitation of Quran. Uh, one of the essays that uh, is in uh, the study Quran that, that, that I actually wrote on the death in the Quran. And when I was originally asked to do that, um, it, it forced me to really read the Quran with the idea of death uh, in mind. And, and what really struck me was that the, the fragrance of death is on every single page of the Quran. And those chapters that we're meant to recite on a regular basis, Yasin, uh, Surat Al-Waqi'ah, and Surat Al-Mulk, they're all death meditations from beginning to end. If you read them from that perspective, you'll clearly see that they're death meditations. And so the, the Quran is, is in essence really a death meditation. And this is not in some morbid sense. It's not the idea that we, we simply become morose, and, 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 and just uh, filled with angst about life. It's actually to heighten the experience of life and the preciousness of life and the extraordinary opportunities that we have. Uh, I have a, a little um, cartoon that reminds me 
somebody did this cartoon where it showed the grim reaper coming to a man. He's at his typewriter and, and, and the man says to him, thank God for deadlines. And, you know, that's a humorous idea, but, but a deadline. You know, the, when you have a deadline, you work harder. And so the idea of having a deadline, meaning the end of your life, which you don't know when it will come, one would think that from that knowledge, we would simply be more apt to act in the present. As uh, Longfellow says in his famous poem, act now in the living present. Uh, because this is it, and, and our hearts, like muffled drums, are beating funeral marches to the grave. This is, this is, this is the reality of it. Our, our heart beat each heart. We have only a certain amount that are allotted for us. We have a certain amount of breasts that are allotted for us. We have approximately 20,000 days in an average lifespan. 20,000 days. It's not a lot. If you have $20,000 and start just handing them out one by one, they'll be gone very quickly. It's not a lot of money. And 20,000 days is not a lot of time. And it seems that the righteous people are people that really understand the preciousness of time. But Ramadan is a precious time. And so even though we've squandered much of the year, let's not squander this extraordinary month that we've been given that even has a day that's like a thousand months. I mean, it's so extraordinary that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put that much barakah in this. So, so tirawat al-Qur'an is really important. And so my advice to myself and all of you, it's something that I do every Ramadan, is really disengage from uh, a lot of things that keep us occupied during the month. So I would really, really recommend that everybody turn off their media. Just don't listen to it. You, don't, you can get by without knowing what's going on. Because what's really going on is in the Qur'an. And this is why uh, Thoreau's famous remark about not reading the times, but reading the eternities. Uh, the times was, uh, like today we have the New York Times, the times was a newspaper in Massachusetts. So he was saying, read the eternities, read those things that last. Uh, don't because you can take a newspaper from 10 years ago and I guarantee you you won't know if nobody tells you the date you won't know uh, by and large that it's any different from today it's all the same stuff this is dunya it's just it repeats itself over and over again the scandals come the scandals go uh, a politician rises a politician falls uh, there's a war somewhere a lot of people die Th this is dunya it's been going on for millennia. And, and, and the, the, the Qur'an is reminding us of the eternal truths, not of these temporal truths. And so it's really important for us to, uh, to really use this time to do as much reflection on the Book of Allah as we can. There's a hadith that Imam al-Tabarani and Tarqutni relate from Aisha radiallahu anhu, anha. Uh, that says قَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم قراءة القرآن في الصلاة أفضل من قراءة القرآن في غير الصلاة that recitation of the Qur'an in the prayer is better than recitation of the Qur'an outside of the prayer and so tarawih is a really good opportunity to, uh, to recite the Qur'an in prayer which is better than re reciting the Qur'an outside of the prayer but then he said صلى الله عليه وسلم or is reported to have said uh, that Qira'at al-Qur'an fi ghayr al-Salah afdaru min al-takbiri wa tasbih that reading the Qur'an is better than takbir and tasbih in other words doing other forms of dhikr because it's the best of all dhikrs and it doesn't negate la ilaha illallah is the best there's afdaru dhikr la ilaha illallah it doesn't negate that hadith because la ilaha illallah is from the Qur'an so you're actually when you, when you say la ilaha illallah you're actually reciting uh, from the Quran. So, so the, the Quran is, is, is the best type of dhikr uh, that we can do and w uh, coupled with prayer is the very best. And I, I once asked Marabt al-Hajj wal-Fahfu uh, rahimahullah about uh, Dalai al-Khirat and he said it was a good book, Dalai al-Khirat, but he said, well, Quranu ahsan, but the Quran is better. Um, so reading the Qur'an and getting back to the Qur'an is really something very important for this community. 
Um, there's another uh, beautiful hadith that Imam Muslim relates on Abi Umama. قال سمعت رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقول اقرأوا القرآن فإنه يأتي يوم القيامة شفيعا لأصحابه Read the Quran or recite the Quran because it will come on the day of judgment as an intercessor for those who, who uh, were its companions. So Ashab al-Quran are the people that are always with the Quran, that recite it all of the time. And Imam al-Bayhaqi relates a, a hadith from Anas, from the Prophet that said, نَوِّرُوا مَنَازِرُكُمْ بِالصَّرَاتِ وَقِرَاءَةَ الْقُرْآنِ uh, illumine your houses, your, your, your domiciles, with prayer and recitation of Qur'an. Uh, there's hadiths that indicate not to make your house a graveyard. A house, if you recite al-Baqarah in, uh, in, in your home, shaitan will not even think about entering that house for three days. So the Qur'an is a, is a protection. Uh, one of uh, my uh, favorite uh, traditions is about the uh, the, the statement Samara uh, ibn Jundub an an Nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam Imam al Bayhaqi relates it and even though uh, some have said that it's weak it's also it's it's uh, has other uh, narrations and Ibn Taymiyyah said it's marfu' and mawquf but its meaning is certainly uh, absolutely sound which is kullu mu'dibin and in a riwayah kullu adibin yuhibbu an tu'ata ma'dubatuhu every uh, host of a banquet loves that his banquet is attended and then it said wa ma'dubatu allahi al-qur'an the banquet of god is the qur'an fala tahjuruhu so don't miss out don't don't not show up to the banquet. This is God's banquet. And it's beautiful because ma'duba, which we, we, there's a dhamma over the dal, uh, is also related to ma'daba, which is the ma'daba is the place where you learn to discipline, uh, your, your, you learn discipline. And so again, we get back to taqwa and disciplining the soul. And so it's really important during this time to, to work on disciplining yourself. Try not to overeat. One of the things about the body, the Prophet ﷺ said that it's enough for the son of Adam to have just luqaymat, small morsels that uh, that keep the back straight. Uh, but if you have to, then a third for food, a third for air, a third for water. But but that's that's if you have to. The 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 origin is the luqaymat, which is how the Prophet ﷺ lived. And one of the things we know now in physiology is that. You, you do need a certain amount of food to sustain your health and you shouldn't do anything that will harm that. But one of the things that we found, most people do overeat and that the, when the, the, the less you eat before you get to that point uh, beyond which is dangerous, your body actually gets better physiologically at using the, the caloric energy that's given through the food. And so the body actually becomes better and more efficient but when we overeat, we fall into all these health. And that's why sumu tasahu is a, a hadith that's related in a lot of the books. Fast and become well. So there's actually, and now we know all this about intermittent fasting. Uh, all, now everybody talks about intermittent fasting. And, but we, we have always had this because our bodies are actually designed to spend periods of time without food. Uh, and and, and it's, a, it's a healthy thing. It's a good thing. So not overeating, and then also just guarding the tongue, backbiting, which is such a problem. And people don't realize, but your comments on, on, on the internet, can, they're also forms of backbiting. And, uh, and just, it's, it's very sad that, that uh, so many people don't realize that putting it on there is like permanently, like anybody who reads it, after that, if it's a negative remark, especially if there's obscenities. And unfortunately, I mean, I think most of these people are trolls and they're not actually Muslims. They just use Muslim names because I couldn't imagine any Muslim speaking so foully. I mean, I just, at least not a practicing Muslim because the Prophet ﷺ said that the believer is, is, is not foul. And one of the signs of the latter days 
is yadhar al-fuhsh wa tafahush, that the obscenities will become commonplace. And, and, he, and he also said tafahush, which, because an, an obscenity usually occurs spontaneity, through spontaneity. Somebody just spontaneously uh, says something out of anger. But tafahush is actually to do it uh, affectedly as, as an effect. That, that, uh, and, and now people say it like they're nothing. It's as if these words no longer have meaning. I mean, when I was young, you never heard in public spaces the type of foul language that you hear now just commonplace amongst people. It's a very bad sign. And Toynbee marks it as one of the hallmarks of a civilization on its way out. And um, which I know there's a lot of people that think they'll be happy when they see the collapse of uh, this civilization. But the truth is they have no idea what's coming. Uh, people have no idea uh, what what social order is and, and when things break down, what happens. And if it's going to happen, I mean, th- there's nothing that can stop it. These are things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, decrees. And, and when they happen, and they can't bring it forward and they can't delay it. But we should do everything to... To, to want to uh, maintain social order, public order, because of the blessings of living in a time of, of, of peace, wherever you are. And if, if there isn't peace, you should be doing everything you can to work toward peace, uh, because it's, it's, it's horrible, especially for uh, women and children and, uh, and elderly people. I mean, young people, unfortunately, there's a kind of excitement that goes with war. And this is one of the things that Dorothy uh, Sayers mentions in her book uh, Prisons We Choose to Live In where she talks about nobody ever wants to talk about the attraction that young people have to war young men in particular and and until we deal with that we'll never deal with with um, with preventing wars and this is why uh, the Jahili Arabs were very well aware of that in the, in the, in the uh, Sahih of al-Bukhari the lines of Imr al-Qais about war being seductive to every young ignoramus are actually mentioned. They were jahili lines of poetry, but the Sahaba considered them worthy of repeating during times of fitna. So just uh, hopefully having a safe and peaceful time uh, and using this time of Ramadan, it's a, it's, a, it's a great time of blessing. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, make your Ramadan a Ramadan of of virtue and of um, solace and of family and and blessings, inshallah. And and also supplication is very important during this time. Uh, supp- supplicating for our community, for our ummah, uh, our globe is obviously going through a lot. And many, many places there's ex- incredible difficulty and hardship. And uh, those of us who are blessed to be in places where we're not experiencing a lot of the things that other people are experiencing. It's a time to really magnify those blessings and, and avoid complaining. I mean, people will complain about the fact that the samosa wasn't cooked uh, properly or something like that. I mean, really stupid things to, to complain about. We should just really try to avoid complaining as much as possible. And then, uh, and then also trying to unite people because... You know, I've, I've been thinking a lot just about uh, you know, conflict theory and there, there, there are real forces out there that are trying to, to really create a lot of conflict in our societies all around the world because there are committed ideologues, enthusiasts that actually believe uh, that conflict is a good thing until the great revolution comes and until the great egalitarian society is created through some kind of utopian dream. And this is a, a real problem because these people work towards creating confrontation be, uh, between the young and the old, between the male and the female, between the, uh, the different various ethnicities and races. I mean, these are all demonic forces working in the world. And our tradition is a tradition that brings people together. Our tradition is a tradition that makes brothers and sisters of different uh, groups and if people say that the Muslims themselves don't live up to that, it doesn't matter. That's their business. It's not our business. It's their business. Our business is to do it ourselves, for us to live up to the truth of this faith. 
and, and to live according to the principles that the Prophet ﷺ gave us. Because that's the religion. What people do is what they do. And whether it's in accordance with the religion or not is determined by whether they're following our prophetic tradition or not. That, that's how it's determined. Uh, and, and otherwise, uh, it's, it's just a free-for-all. So those Muslims that are dishonoring Islam or, or um, are, are themselves wrongdoers and sinners and people of, of arrogance or whatever sinfulness that they're expressing, those are all in spite of their faith. They're, they're not because of their faith. And so that's where we have to get back to is recognizing what does our faith say? Not what do Muslims do? What does our faith say? And then each one of us as an individual has to align with that truth. And that's what this month is all about. It's about realigning ourselves vertically uh, with the heavens. And, and inshallah, we, we have uh, 29 or 30 days to do that. And, and hopefully we'll be able to retain as much of that as possible throughout the rest of the year until we have, inshallah, if Allah gives us another opportunity, we, none of us know. So may Allah bless all of your Ramadans and inshallah may it be a Ramadan of tirawat al-Quran and jira al-Qulub, the polishing of your hearts, inshallah. Barakallah fikum, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa